Now it's time to say a very good morning to Mr. Peter Hitchens. Peter, how are you? Morning. So far, so good. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Um, interesting piece you put out this morning about numbers, because we're hearing an awful lot from people, particularly those defending the actions of the police at the moment, that they don't have enough people. Uh, you would suggest that that's not true. Well, some years ago, when I wrote a book on the whole police and criminal justice crisis uh, called The Abolition of Liberty, I went down to what was then the National Archives, a place where you could actually look at the, the, the physical books. Mm. Uh, and I found, looking back, that if you, if you checked the numbers of police and, and measured them against the population at the time, uh, that in fact there'd never been so many as there were in the, the early years of the century. In fact, they peaked at about 144,000. This is England and Wales in 2009. Uh, they then fell a bit. Uh, they're now climbing again. I think there's something, if you put in the British Transport Police, something around about 135,000 now in England and Wales. So that's quite a few more than, mm. than for instance, you had in 1951 when there were 63,000. Uh, and it, it, you could go on. I mean, the numbers, the, the numbers with which they used to manage to patrol the streets effectively before the mid-60s were much, much lower than they have now. The other thing you have to remember is the police have been relieved of quite a lot of duties. They no longer have to secure commercial premises. They don't do parking. They practically, as far as I can see, abandoned doing traffic patrols. Mm. Uh, they also used to do what the Crown Prosecution Service does now. They were in charge of prosecutions in magistrates' courts, and they don't do that either. And they've also been supplemented with tens of thousands of, of white-collar uh, back-office staff who they never had before the 1960s. So it's always seemed to me that the complaint of not having enough people uh, to patrol the streets preventively has been empty. Yeah. Uh, what it is is a complete change in what the police actually themselves want to do, and they don't really want to be slogging along a wet street. Uh, in on, on their own preventing crime. They, they prefer the current method of waiting for crime to happen and then reacting to it. Well, think about that for a moment. Uh, it's sad but true uh, that if you are uh, attacked, robbed, uh, or, or anything horrible happens to you, a police officer can't actually do much for you mm. unless he's good or she is good at first aid. Uh, the thing has already happened. And the, the, the spilt milk can't, be, can't actually be put back in the bottle. The really crucial purpose of the police is to prevent these horrible things happening in the first place. And people will say, well, it's, it's all petty crime you're talking about, to which I reply, to most people, petty crime is what they're likely to experience. Mm. It may be petty in statistical terms and petty to a, a, a lofty journalist sitting somewhere miles from trouble. But if you live on a rough estate, and somebody is smashing your windows or making your life intolerable with noise and intimidation, that's petty crime to them. But it's not petty to you. It can ruin your life. It can yeah. drive people into serious mental illness and perhaps to suicide. So these are the things which the police no longer prevent or do. And I think that that's what they were set up to do. They should return to doing them. And they then have much better relations with the public, as they used to do. And the current extremely chilly relations between the police and the public uh, would, would would come to an end and we would return to being their friends and they would return to being our friends mm. instead of referring to us as they often do these days contemptuously as civilians as if as if they were some kind of elite corps and we were just <laughs> a yeah, I mean, do you think the advent of, of the sort of uh, Marxist organisations like what we saw last night, the anarchists, I mean, there's an anarchist group in Bristol who have been tweeting out quite openly um, that they were there uh, to try and disrupt the police, but they were doing it in a peaceful manner until the police then started wading in with pepper spray. Now, I don't have any pictures of the pepper spray being used, so I have no idea if that allegation is true. But is there now more of, a, of, of this kind of rump uh, rather like it is in America, of, of people who wish to literally do away with the police because that's their ideology and they'll stop oh, at nothing until they do it. I don't know about that. Maybe that, that such people are always going to be a minority in any, in any serious society. And obviously, I can't comment on what happened in Bristol directly, not having been there right. or seen it. But I can say, as, as, I, as you, I think we've discussed before, I, I used to be a Bolshevik revolutionary. I used to take part in demonstrations which were none too peaceful. And I would say without any hesitation that, uh, that, that some of us wanted trouble and some of us wanted more trouble than others. And, uh, and, and we got it. And the police in, in those days certainly have behaved with extreme restraint, mm. uh, given what we were trying to do and were very hard to provoke. Uh, I regret greatly the things that I did in those days, but uh, there's no question at all that there were elements on the, on the political left which wanted trouble to, to change the political atmosphere of the country. Mm. And people will do this. And I very much sympathize with the police when they're attacked. I always 
I always have actually, and and I, and, and, and I always will. I think that, that, that remembering the way that they they behaved back in those days, I was quite impressed. Yeah. No, I think I think I think we all don't like to see. I mean, any right thinking person does not want to see police officers being attacked. I mean, at one point yesterday, I believe that uh, a fire, a sort of a, an incendiary of some kind was thrown into a police van where there was police officers still inside it, you know, which then becomes a much more serious thing. It's no longer just kind of, you know, left wing anarchistic japes. It's actually, you know, possibly attempted murder. But I mean, don't you also think, for example, because you said this at the weekend before Bristol, um, that you know the protest that happened on Saturday was a much more good-natured event, but you could see in the faces of the cops there they weren't quite sure what to do. They didn't really know how to react. Well, it's an interesting illustration of how civil society can make a difference. Mm. Uh, the, the, there was an awful lot. I'm, it's I think there's been some mistaken analysis of what happened in, in, in Clapham the week weekend before last, and, and and maybe the police have been subject to some unfair criticism for for what happened there. But I, I would say that there's no doubt that, a, that an awful lot of people who previously ignored uh, the change in the police into this uh, shouty, overbearing militia, which uh, has, has been taking place in the past year, uh, that that suddenly jumped out of a small minority of commenters and, uh, and, and, and media into the mainstream, and the police didn't like it at all. And I think, uh, therefore, you, it just goes to show how if civil society mobilises and criticises the policy, it changes it. And I've no doubt the police behaviour at the weekend in London was influenced by mm. the criticism of Clapham. Well, that just shows what could or would have happened if civil society had mobilised itself against this crazy lockdown well, exactly. a year ago. Well, exactly. it, it really can make a difference. If, if, the, if, if the commentariat, if the legal profession... If, 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 if politicians say this is wrong, it's a mistake, it really can make a difference. But they wouldn't do it. So yes. we've heartened into this lunacy from which there appears to be absolutely no escape of endless uh, economic and damage and endless restrictions of, to, of, of liberty, which, to, which just seems to go on forever and ever and ever and has become a permanent feature of our society because it hardened into that without opposition a year mm. ago. No, indeed. Uh, but also, let's not forget that the original purpose of the Saturday, of the Sunday march in Bristol, and I'm sure there were others around the country, was against this new police bill, which is seeking to prevent protest in any way, which is sort of deemed to be by the powers that be a bit of a nuisance. Well, in that case, they 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 they, they kicked themselves in. Well, the, they did in the backside, didn't they? I mean, it's a, it, the, the, they couldn't they couldn't have made the case for more police powers better than by behaving in this stupid fashion. Right. You have. It's, it's in a society where people restrain themselves intelligently. You have less heavyweight enforcement of the law. That goes back to Edmund Burke. You, you, if, if people behave themselves, there's no need for a strong state. It's in the decline of our behaviour towards each other and, and indeed uh, our, our general lack of understanding of our own liberty, which has led to the creation of this horrible strong state in the past uh, 20 odd years, which is what I was writing about when I, when I wrote that book back in 2004. And you also said at the weekend that um, one of the reasons you don't any longer take part in these types of demonstrations is that you kind of feel that um, they, they show weakness, that they don't really mean anything, they don't prove anything, and that the powers that be simply laugh at them. Well, I'm afraid that's so. I've taken part in a lot of demonstrations, and I can't think of a single one that achieved its, <laughs> uh, that achieved its objective. I mean, there, there have been protests in the world which have achieved objectives, but I haven't been on any of them. And in many cases, they, uh, people have attributed to demonstrations things which would have happened anyway because of, uh, at the high levels of politics, people were beginning to shift uh, and uh, w would have acted anyway. I don't think demonstrations made any difference. But in general, I remember uh, being on a demonstration years ago and a, a very clever one of my Bolshevik comrades turned to me and said, well, this is, a, this is just a demonstration of influence. Just, you, here we are wandering along the street. No one's going to pay any attention to us. Uh, you don't ever see a, a demonstration by the road lobby or the oil industry, uh, but they seem to get their way an awful lot of the time. <laughs> I, I, that sank in. I, right. I, 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 if, if people want into this government, going and wandering about the streets of London on a Saturday afternoon is a pretty uh, un, um, well, pretty ineffective yes. way of doing it. Well, rather, so I, just, rather, rather, I, I just don't have to explain why I don't really take part in these things anymore. No. I think they, they, they are... People fool themselves. They see lots of people who agree with them walking at their side, and they don't 
of course, take notice of the millions of people who don't agree with them who are sitting at home. No, quite. And I mean, all you've got to do is look back to the days when a million or more people marched in London to stop the war in Iraq and to stop the invasion of Iraq. And they, many of them under the banner of Stop the War Coalition. And of course, the one yeah. achievement of Stop the War Coalition was that they didn't stop the war. Alas, no. And it, 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 is, it, it remains the case. There's a huge failure again in, in my train, as there has been on, on, on Syria and Libya, too. A huge failure in my trade, a huge failure in the political class, a huge failure in the civil service. And I still say that the Iraq disaster will not have been acknowledged by the British government until Elizabeth Wilmshurst, the only civil servant who actually resigned in protest against it, gets a very, very high level decoration. I would say a, a, a knight grand cross of the Order of the Bath would be the minimum uh, for having, having done that courageous and solitary thing. But most people just let it happen. Uh, just as they've let this current disaster happen, and therefore and, 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 and demonstrations don't change this. No, but I mean, how do, we, how do they go forward? Because I'm, I mean, we just had Norman Brennan on, who you probably know is a spokesperson for the Law and Order Foundation, a former police officer. He fears that we're going to see more of this. We're going to see more kind of insurrection, if you like, of people having a go, just because we know there are lots of people who like doing it. I mean, you know, loads of people uh, in Bristol, no doubt in every inner city of this country, would love to have a little bit of a punch up with the cops of a Saturday night when the summer comes and it's nice weather uh, and they can all be out and about. Well, those people who engage in that kind of folly I should understand that if they really seriously believe in the liberty they claim to be pursuing, that they're doing the opposite of what they intend, uh, that they will produce support for the police uh, and indeed for stern measures against them, even from people like me who believe strongly in human liberty. It is stupid uh, beyond belief if, uh, if you believe in liberty to engage in this kind of activity. And anybody with any sense should discourage it and nobody with any sense should take part in it. Mm. Let's talk about something else you wrote about this weekend, and that is the power of the flag, um, because a lot of debate took place last week, not least here at Talk Radio, uh, about uh, the two BBC presenters who made fun of Robert Jenrick's flag um, and were roundly criticised for it. I criticised them for it, not because I'm a great believer in waving union flags around all the time, but just because I thought, you know, we're paying these guys. Uh, we're not paying them to be comedians. We're paying them to be uh, intelligent, intellectual kind of interviewers of politicians and to be kind of smugly sixth form like sort of sniggering because you think the flag's a bit small was quite beneath them. Well, two separate issues here. One is the behaviour of the BBC presenters, which is typical of the BBC. They, 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 they seem to assume a certain attitude towards flags uh, that they thought that they presumably hold and they thought everybody held. Uh, and, and, and as a result, they, they, they appeared to a lot of people to be sneering at the flag itself. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other issue is, is whether Mr. Jenry uh, ought to be uh, displaying a large national flag uh, in his spare room. Uh, and whether it is correct in my, for the government ministers to identify themselves with the flag in a, in a parliamentary democracy with an adversarial parliament. I say not. The government is the government. It's not the nation. Uh, the, the, the prime minister is the head of the government. He's not the head of the state. And the flag should, should represent the whole nation. There are many people who don't agree with Mr. Jenrick, who don't think he should be a minister. There are many people who don't agree with Mr. Johnson, who don't think he should be prime minister or that his party should be in power. They cannot appropriate the flag of the whole nation uh, to, to, to beautify their activities and make out that they're serving the whole nation. They are, they are partisan government. And e even when they are doing things which are in, in the national interest, they should always remember that. That's one of the reasons why we have a monarchy so that people in government uh, aren't identified with the nation, and therefore it's easier for them to be criticised and easier for them to be removed from office. It's, it seems to me to be very like the Blair government's muscling in on monarchy and its power grab, and it's, it also tried to appropriate the Union Jack. So there are two completely separate issues here. The BBC, the, the BBC uh, presenters figuring is one thing, but I don't think ministers should, should sit alongside flags. I don't think they should give press conferences with flags. They aren't the president of the United States, who is the head of state. They are ministers in a, in, in a, in a partisan government. And the same goes for this ridiculous new press briefing room, which is being uh, constructed. Oh, well, the one down. built by the Russians. That's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where you turn, isn't it, when you want the press briefing Absolutely, room. yeah. Built. A couple of they secret microphones here and there. Yeah, microphones, they got. But I mean, yeah, amazing. I should. My flat in Moscow. For a start. They, even, they even put them in my car. 
Actually, on, on the subject of that, what have you made of the latest kind of um, joshing, for want of a better phrase, between uh, Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin? You know, Biden puts out this rather bizarre claim, not bizarre claim, but I mean, unusual claim, shall we say, for President of the United States of America, that, that, that Putin is a killer. Putin then um, sort of says to him that he hopes his health remains good and that they should have a debate about it. Um, it's all very strange, isn't it? It is very strange. But one of the things that was, uh, I mean, there's, there's no doubt that, the, that the, the Russian state does kill people. I don't think it's entirely alone in this in the world, but I, it, it, let's, not, let's not beat about the bush. We know that it, it's tried to kill people uh, here beyond doubt. The difficulty is in attributing direct responsibility to, mm. uh, to, to anyone here because the Russian state is a, is a chaotic and often gangsterish thing, not necessarily under the control of the Kremlin. But it, it, what is strange is these constant assertions that the, the, the Russian government has been intervening in the internal politics of other countries. I, I've no doubt that it does intervene in the internal politics, particularly of its neighbours. Uh, but I think one needs evidence before one makes these claims, and I've seen very little of it. And it, an exchange of that kind makes Joe Biden look slightly childish and, uh, and, and Vladimir Putin look rather more adult. And it doesn't do any good. I think if you're dealing with Russia, uh, then I think a more, it's in general, a more adult approach is necessary. Russia is, is often done bad things, but it also often it simply acts according to its interests. And if, if we push it around in the way that we have been in the past, we create unnecessary trouble. I, 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 my problem is I know a bit about Russia. And as in almost all political and, and any other major argument, like, it's a real disadvantage to know anything about this sort of discussion. <laughs> It really is. And that's unfortunately the world in which we live. And I was going to say, I mean, the whole issue of flags has become something which I suppose we notice more now because it has become a symbol of something. And I'm assuming really that the use of the of, 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 of the Union Jack in this country by the government is to kind of delineate that we are no longer in the European Union. I mean, that's their kind of subliminal message in the same way that whenever you see anyone appearing, as I did yesterday, Myriad McGuinness, um, from the European Union was on with Andrew Marr and she had a European Union flag behind her and I tweeted out, you know, I didn't see him having a go at that because the EU has more flags, I think, than anybody. Well, there is an element of that, for certain, but there is also this this attempt, as I say, I, the, the, the EU has had nothing to do, for instance, with the big government press conferences on COVID, where ministers and indeed experts and the scientific and medical officers have appeared beside Union Jacks. Uh, that has nothing to do with the, with, with the issue. And it, 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 I, I, again, I, if, if the government's going to make us independent of the, of the EU, then fine. But I don't think it needs to do so by these by by these uh, by, by claiming that it is itself the government of the the whole people. That was the outrageous claim which the Blairites, if you remember, made back in 1997. Yes. And they said the New Labour was the political arm of the British people as a whole. Now that's never true in right. a free country of a political party. It's it, 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 it's it's a, that, that's the first step towards a one-party state, believing that. Yes, yeah. they also Keep they also away. kind of they also coined that dreadful phrase, didn't they? Cool Britannia, um, and and basically caused the splitting up of one of the great rock bands of this country by oh, yeah. inviting them into Downing Street. And then and then actually, I think the the the, the attack which they then made on the British Constitution, which was huge and still largely acknowledged, uh, was done under the cover of. of of a British flag. And the thing I always re recollect is that, that ridiculous uh, fake demonstration in Downing Street mm. when Blair arrived at number 10, uh, where the, the street was filled with people waving little Union Jacks. Well, the truth is that, of course, you can't even get into Downing Street uh, it, it, <laughs> as a normal human being. They'd been busted in. They were Labour, Labour Party workers, most of whom hated the Union Jack as, as, as much as they hated any flag. I, I never found all that much uh, all that much active patriotism in the in the Labour Party of those days, or quite frankly, since. So, it, it, and yet, it's this event having been filmed is still shown over and over again without anybody pointing out that it is as fake a demonstration as anything that any dictatorship has ever mounted. People shouldn't be allowed to fake patriotism. If they're patriots, then they should show it by their actions, not not pretend it by waving flags about. I think you're absolutely right. Peter, well said. Thank you very much indeed. Peter Hitchens from the Mail on Sunday there uh, talking to us again uh, once more with great relish and a good deal of, uh, of, of sympathy and a great deal of intelligence as well. 0344 499 1000. Do you agree with him? Because today's the day uh, I understand that the uh, British flag, the Union Jack, will fly from all 
government buildings now, uh, some of which in Scotland they're a bit worried about because the Scots are saying, well, why do we have to do that? Well, because you're part of Britain. That's why you have to do 